the truth. You can't handle the truth. Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby Land, where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jackwagon. Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. Here we go. Now we're coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and I am live with you, and this is the talk show Hell Hates, and of course, the more you listen, the more you know why. That hulking figure in the background that you see there is none other than Chris Christian J. Pinto. Everybody give Chris a hand. He's glad to be here. We had an outstanding time last night. Um... With our first ever, oh, let's see, let me let me flip the camera over here. There we go. Now everybody can see you. With our first ever Midwest Bible Conference, and if you did not get a chance to see it um, live last night, the um, the the live recording is on my Facebook channel, Facebook.com/slash Pastor Mike Online. Uh, it's already had, I think last night we had about uh, somewhere around 1,800 views, and now there's about 2,400 views of that uh, so far, and it is climbing. The uh, Sermon Audio audience was great. The Facebook audience was great. We had a troll. You had a troll last night. A troll. There, yeah, a troll. I, these guys, on. I don't understand this. If you've got the time to sit and troll people's Facebook feeds, then why don't you go out and get a job and earn a living or something like that? But anyway, uh, during your speaking last night, during my speaking last night, I was told, I was told by uh, uh, Michael here, uh, Lisa told me that uh, some people in our, our Bethel Church Facebook group was alerted to it, that there was a guy that was trolling during the conference last night. And um, and I was going, well, what was he doing? You know, was he getting suggestive? Was he talking lewd? Was he doing anything like that? And what he was doing was he was uh, accusing uh, Pastor Reg Kelly, who's going to be here tonight. He was accusing him of being a charismatic. And then he was um, saying, oh, let's see, what was it? He was he was going on about he mentioned Torah. So I'm going, OK, I know where that's going. He's mentioning the fact that in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, where Paul said all scripture is given by inspiration of God, he comes up with this idea that, well, at the time Paul wrote that, the only scriptures that were around was the Old Testament. And I went, hold on a second. I know what that is. Pastor, the former pastor, now a convicted felon, uh, Jim Staley, who ran one of these Hebrew Roots cults up here in the St. Louis area. He's, I don't know if he came up with that, but that was one of the things that he said. And what they do is they want you to, they want you to um, take that idea that they passed on to you, the idea that the only scripture that was inspired of God when Paul wrote that would be the Old Testament. Therefore, any of our doctrine must come from the Old Testament. And Chris, get this, they don't call I don't know if you know anything about Hebrew roots people or not. They don't call the New Testament the New Testament. They don't call it the New Covenant. They call it the Renewed Covenant. And what they mean by that is, is that Christ died, paid the price for our sins on Calvary, rose again from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father, is the mediator between God and man, and he wants to set us free by making us go back to Mount Sinai and agree to the law covenant that God, that Moses brought down with all these commandments saying, if you do these, ye shall live. And nobody in human history, with the except, exception of Christ, has done those. It is not possible. So they call 
the new covenant or the new testament the renewed covenant in other words we're going back to mount sinai we're going to be under the law and they don't call the law see they've they they did what so many preachers and scholars you're aware of this i'm aware of this i used to do this from the pulpit they don't like what the bible says they don't like how the king james is translated they don't like it because it disproves their doctrine so what they do is, is they go into the original greek or the original hebrew and i find some really off the wall meaning of a greek or hebrew word and they keep searching until something that they find establishes their doctrine and so what they do is with the term the law they say that's translated incorrectly in the new testament because if you read galatians and you read romans and you read these uh, you read the book of hebrews you read these other books in the new testament it over and over consistently tells you that we cannot keep the law the law was given to mankind to manifest sin so that christ could take all of those sins bear them on his body take them to the cross nail them to the cross and so that work is finished so they say the word law doesn't mean law it means torah and what that word means is a teaching and then they get into this little thing where are you really rejecting the teaching of God? Are you rejecting that? And so well, that, go ahead. I, 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 no, I, I've, got, I've, got, I've got a little bit of experience with this. I had a guy several years ago call our ministry. And he called our ministry up and he was talking to me about this. And the, direct, the conversation was going in that direction. And he said to me, he said, well, Chris, have you ever had anybody explain to you the Jewish perspective <laughs> of the New Testament? And I said, well, yeah, you mean the letters of Paul? And he said, he said, no, no, I mean the Jewish perspective. I said, well, now you know the apostle Paul was Jewish, don't you? And he said he was a, I said he was a Pharisee. He, in fact, he called himself a, the Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Um, uh, he repeatedly affirmed his very Jewish nature, his character, his learning, etc. cetera. Uh, and I said, don't you think that if there were anything that was important about the Jewish perspective on the writings of the Old Testament, wouldn't the Apostle Paul, who was the Apostle unto the Gentiles, would he not have communicated that to us in his writings, in all of the different uh, books and letters and so on that he wrote to the New Testament church? And what I basically confronted the guy with is I said, basically what you're telling us is that Paul didn't actually accomplish what it was that he was sent to accomplish by God and that there's some deficiency there and that we need this additional learning exactly. from modern Hebrew roots teachers and this kind of thing. I said it's entirely unreasonable. Uh, the Apostle Paul was Jewish. He was a Pharisee. He understood the Old Testament law. He understood Moses and the prophets, all of that better than anybody here today. And so he told the Gentile churches, he wrote to them and taught them everything that was needed uh, for godliness. And I know what, I mean, part of the argument I would maybe a little bit agree with when Paul says all scripture is inspired of God, the historic context is he is talking about Genesis through Malachi at that point. Mm -hmm. However, he would not have denied right. that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were part of the scripture. Uh, the apostle Peter affirmed that Paul's letters were also part of the scripture and the early church has embraced uh, since the first and second century the uh, books of the New Testament that we have today those books have been embraced as being all part of the Old and New Testament scripture collectively right. So when, when Paul says all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for instruction for reproof for doctrine that the man of God may be perfect, right, truly furnished right. unto all good works and so on, we can find everything that we need to understand our walk of faith in Christ in the Bible, in the 66 books, Genesis through Revelation. Uh, we don't need these Hebrew roots, <laughs> Jewish perspective ideas. You know what's funny to me is I have, I had a lady that emailed me here a while back and she said that she had came to the conclusion that the apostle Paul was a counterfeit apostle, that he was a fraud, 
and that none of his books should have been in the Bible. And I've run mm-hmm. into their varying grades of the Hebrew Roots movement. And um, many of them, they hate the Apostle Paul so much. They hate his guts. And they don't like what he said in Galatians. They don't like what he said in Romans. They don't like what he said in Hebrews. And so they'll do one of two things. They will either say to everybody, Paul was a fraud. He should have never, um, he should have uh, never, his book should have never been included in the Torah, in the Bible. They should never be there. They should be taken out. You should ignore them. Or this is what I've seen a lot of them do. They will take Galatians. They will take Romans. They will take Hebrews. And they will do some sort of Bible study on those books. And here you read Galatians and it clearly, Paul clearly condemns the idea that if you try to keep the law, you're going to fail and you're going to go to, you're not going to make, you're not going to have eternal life. It's not going to work. So then they take the book of Galatians and they twist, they rest the scripture. They twist it, they rest it, they, um, they augment it, they retranslate it. And by the time they're done talking, you would think that you're reading Galatians and you would think that Paul is really telling you, you need to go keep the law if you want to be saved. If you really want God to love you the way he loves me, then you need to go and keep the law. But anyway, this guy was trolling last night during... Can I say one thing? Uh, yeah, go I'm ahead. So sorry. Yeah. It rem- as I was hearing you talk about that, about how they, how they oppose the Apostle Paul... It just reminds the problem I think is that they are resurrecting the ancient doctrines of the Pharisees. Right. They're basically bringing in uh, the the old doctrine that they settled at the first council of Jerusalem, where the Pharisees were teaching, except the Gentiles get circumcised and keep the law, they cannot be saved. That was what Paul specifically opposed, and he opposed that throughout the rest of his journey and his teachings and so on and his writings in the New Testament. Right. And it just sounds like they're trying to resurrect these old uh, Pharisee doctrines from 2,000 years ago, and that's why they have such a strong opposition to Paul and his writings. The Pharisees had such a strong opposition to him. They tried to have him killed on multiple occasions. Somebody else that has a, uh, a problem with Paul's writings, a man by the name of Barack Hussein Obama, um, this article, I've posted this on Pastor, or on Facebook.com, Pastor Mike Online. Um, you got to read this. A new article out, a new book um, called Rising Star. Uh, the sex secrets of the young Barack Obama have been revealed in an authoritative new biography of the ex-president. According to this biography, Obama slept with his girlfriend Genevieve Cook on their first date before she wrote him a poem. I won't even read some of this. Uh, But anyway, they also did cocaine together. And after that, they split. Then she slept with his best friend. Obama, here we go. There's a lot of you out there who had it in your mind that Obama really was a woman and that Michelle really was a man. Well, guess what? According to this book now, a one, this is a 1,078 page biography. Rising Star, The Making of Barack Obama. Uh, it's gonna come out May 9th. According to this book, now this guy's dead serious. Obama also considered a gay relationship while at college now how here's here's my question how do you consider having a gay relationship with somebody without actually having well I, I don't I don't know I don't know I wasn't there I can't speculate but it just sounds fishy to me Obama also considered a gay relationship while at college, twice proposed to another white girlfriend, and cheated on Michelle with his ex during the first year of their relationship. Again, the book is called Rising Star, The Making of Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, Let's see here. 
The 1,078-page biography is the most comprehensive work ever on Obama and the first to be published since he left office. Well, that would certainly explain, Mike, why Obama, during his eight years in office, promoted sexual depravity. Well, sure. That was, that was his... He was depraved. He was depraved, and he encouraged others to be depraved. It reminds me of Manasseh in the Old Testament, who encouraged yeah. others to practice evil and so on. He encouraged people in America and around the world to practice sodomy and transgenderism and all this other kind of stuff. You remember... Barack Obama is the is the product of Jocelyn Elders being the sur the Surgeon General of the United States of America. Uh, he is the product. You did a video on the Kinsey Report, right? The right? Kinsey Syndrome. Yeah. Explain some of that in in the light of what we're now being revealed about Barack Hussein. What are your what are your thoughts in relating to your research into Kinsey and his report and so on? Tell them a little bit about what that is and kind of give your expertise on that. Move into the microphone yeah. a little bit closer. The uh, the Kinsey syndrome is a documentary we rep we produced a number of years ago, and I spent about three and a half years doing the research on it with one of the leading experts on Kinsey, probably the leading expert in the world, Dr. Judith Reisman, who worked with the Department of Justice, the DOJ, and the OJJDP, which is their juvenile department, uh, back during the Reagan administration. Dr. Reisman uh, was brought in to document all the research on the influence of Alfred Kinsey in our education system and in American law, which a lot of people are not aware of. But Kinsey published his Kinsey reports, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, and then Sexual Behavior in the Human Female back in the 1940s and 50s. It was the Kinsey reports that inspired Hugh Hefner to begin Playboy magazine. Hefner openly admitted that in interviews and so on. Uh, Playboy magazine then really began the whole process of normalizing pornography and sexual immorality in America. But Kinsey was definitely, he used false information, junk science, uh, to promote things like homosexuality, he promoted pedophilia. All of this uh, depravity that we're seeing today, a lot of the beginnings of it began with Kinsey and his false statistics. Kinsey came up with a, a false statistic that somewhere between 10% to 30% of American men, he said, were homosexual. 10 to 30%. All the later studies showed that that number was really one to one and a half to two percent two percent being the high number in the entire western hemisphere in much more extensive uh, studies that were done in the 1990s and so on but kinsey what he did was he went into the prisons and he interviewed guys in prison who where they obviously have a higher rate of homosexual practices and he mingled those in with the general population and manipulated the numbers to come up with these inflated ideas but uh, the gays for years and years made reference to that 10% argument as though it were factual and authoritative and so on, when in fact it was all based on lies conjured right. up by Kinsey. Uh, but so much of what we're seeing today with the LGBT movement, so much of Which that, stands for lettuce, gravy, <laughs> bacon, tomato, right. LGBT, and Q, which is queso. Queso, Which is what right. we had for lunch, like exactly. supper last night. Well, that whole movement, uh, lesbian, bisexual, what is, no, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual. Confusing, isn't it? It's hard yeah, to remember. And, and queer, and they want to add on to it. And there are articles on this. Where they're going with this, Mike, they want to eventually legalize and normalize pedophilia in the United States, and I believe in the Western world. This is why you have the Democrats that are working with the Muslims, even though the Democratic Party has nothing in common with Islam, right. I believe the reason they're working with the Muslims is because the Muslims have already normalized pedophilia in their culture. Wow. That is that that is my theory on all of this. That's what they have in common. And the, a lot of people don't realize that in Islam, they have normalized transgenderism. They've had transgender Muslims for more than a thousand years they still have them there today. And I believe this is why Barack Obama, bringing it back to Obama, why he could support the LGBT movement and support Islam at the same time 
even though some Muslims will have homosexuals put to death, that's where people get confused because for some strange reason, uh, they condemn two adult men practicing homosexuality. And of course, we would agree with that, but my point is they do not condemn pedophilia. That's the strange thing. The same spirit that um, we see in um, the Islam movement, the Democratic Party, and weak, spineless Republicans mm -hmm. who bow and cave to everything. Ephesians 2.2, 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, and I've said it before, and you're seeing it, I'm seeing it, this world is on course, and it's heading toward um, enthroning the Antichrist um, as the king of the world. And um, so we used to walk according to that course, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And I've said it before, if you want to understand conspiracy theories, if you want to understand the intricate layers of everything that's going on in this world, then understand that there is a very malevolent, evil uh, dragon spirit called Lucifer, called the devil, that is in the hearts of everybody in the world that is lost including your neighbors, family members, um, politicians, business leaders, bankers, movie producers, uh, the superintendent of the local public school. I mean, they don't have to be card-carrying members of the Illuminati. If they are lost, they have a spirit in them, whether they are Hugh Hefner, as you mentioned, that has a spirit in him that is... Uh, pushing all of this pornography out there, or you're the one looking at the pornography. You and Hugh Hefner have the same spirit working in you because you're a child. They're both children of disobedience. Anyway, back to Kinsey, back to the effect that the Kinsey uh, report had on this country and the shaping of the morals of Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Barack Hussein Obama, et al. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, what people, what, what, what I think most Christians need to know today is that our modern education system, the education system where they're systematically trying to sexualize children by right. introducing all of these depraved teachings to them, all of that modern sex education is based on the Kinsey reports. Yeah. It's based on the so-called expert information from Kinsey. Now, Mike, this gets very, very disturbing because a lot of people don't realize when they talk about the need to educate kids from the earliest age possible, the reason that they do it is because of the interviews that Kinsey himself financed with pedophiles. Mm. Kinsey literally hired pedophiles, he paid them money mm. to molest children and to record their responses with a stopwatch. What? Yes, that's exactly what he did. This is what we talk about in the Kinsey Center. There was another documentary called The Til uh, Children of Table 34. We actually interviewed one of the, the, the people, a woman who is now an older woman today. Thank the Lord. She's a Christian lady out in California, very dear uh, friend of our ministry even today. But her father according to her testimony, was one of the subjects who worked for Alfred Kinsey, and her father molested her using a stopwatch and then documented the information and mailed it in to Alfred Kinsey. And we've got her interview on camera. You see it in that film. My, my, um, but yeah, this is what Kinsey did. And based upon the information that he gathered, you see, when the kids were being molested, what they were doing is they were yelling, they were screaming, they were crying, they were trying to get away. Kinsey documented all of this, but rather than acknowledge that they were in torment, he chose to call their responses. I don't, you know, it's it. I don't even want to say it. He chose to call it child orgasm. That's what he chose to oh call. Oh my. It. Okay, and I know it's very disturbing. Very, very. I understand all of that, 
But it's important that people understand this. So what he did then, Mike, is he said, because of this, there is because the children actually enjoy what's happening. That's what he said. Therefore, you can't say that the pedophiles harm the children. That was his argument. And the reason they changed American law for many years and gave very light sentences to pedophiles was because of this false, evil testimony from Alfred Kinsey. That's the reason they changed the law. We have um, listeners, undoubtedly, that at one time in their past, they were approached by an adult. And um, by me saying the word approached, you understand what I'm saying. They were approached by an adult, maybe a neighbor, maybe a family member, maybe in some cases, Chris, a church member. And if you were to ask these survivors of that about that, they will tell you that is a dirty, stinking, no good lie. There's nothing about that that they had any enjoyment from. Um, while you were talking, Romans 1, 26 came to mind. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And what, what Romans 1 has to do with is the absence of the gospel and the absence of a fear and a respect for the most high God. And as this nation, and as our church, you're here, I'm here, uh, Brother Kelly is coming up tonight. We are here because we are seeing the absence of the Word of God in churches. We already we already know the Word of God. We already know the Bible isn't present in most Americans' lives, most Canadians' lives, most Australians, most Kenyans. We already know the Word of God is not present in these people's lives. They want nothing to do with it. But now we're seeing the dismissal of the Word of God. It's being done subtly. It's being done piecemeal. No pastor that I'm aware of ever got up and said to his congregation, um, I think the Bible is a bunch of hooey. We're never going to use it here again. Don't even bring it up. And we're just going to do whatever we want to do. But What's happening is because so much of the Word of God is being dismissed now and pastors aren't even preaching it to begin with, in the absence of the Word of God, we know that devils move in. And because mankind, because this nation has a hatred for the Bible and for the Word of God, this is why we see what we see here. Uh, verse 27, likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, here it is, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Think Hillary. Think Bill Clinton. Think Barack Obama. Think of the rock stars, the movie stars, the, um, the leaders in this country that have turned their backs on God, turned their back on the Bible, and these people have a reprobate mind. We're seeing sodomy being thrust upon the, uh, the viewers of movies, cartoons, I was watching the uh, the movie The Man of Steel, the remake of Superman, and in the background there's these two guys kissing. In um, uh, Katy Perry's video of uh, You're a Firework, it's all about, well there's several different stories going on in this video, but it ends up these two teenage boys are making out. In mm. children's cartoons, Chris, yep. they're having they're having male uh, boys and boys kissing one yeah. another. This is the result of what? What was his name? Alfred Kinsey. Alfred Kinsey. Alfred Kinsey, turning this country over, saying it's okay to do all of these things when God said no, it's not. And there was you can see it. When did the Kinsey report come out? 
19, late 40s and early 50s. Late 40s, other 50. You can see a transformation of America from, from 1960 to 1970. In 10 years' time, there were things that were never right to do or say publicly. And in 10 years' time, every bit of that went out the door. All right, there's, can I make one more point, Mike? Go one ahead. more point on this issue. What I just told you about how Kinsey said that the children's responses somehow or other showed that they enjoyed what was happening. Kinsey was doc, uh, documenting kids as young as five months old, oh. one year old, two year old, three year old, and so on. All of them with these responses that had been recorded with a stopwatch. Kinsey argued, and this is so important for Christians and parents across the country to understand, because I believe this is the direction that the movement is headed. Kinsey argued that because of his so-called scientific data, he said there's no proof that pedophiles actually hurt children. He said what the harm is, the people who harm the children are the parents and people in authority when they find out about this contact and they get angry about it and wow. they get upset. He said that's what does all the harm to the children. And I believe what they want to do eventually, Mike, is we're already seeing elements of this at work is they want to they want to find a way to legalize child molestation pedophilia and punish parents who defend their kids and try to keep their kids away from these relationships see what i'm saying right now they're already passing laws to prevent parents from getting any kind of counseling right. for their children if let's say you have a 15 year old boy and he's having homosexual thoughts and you want to get him some professional counseling, they're passing laws in certain states that say you can't do that because supposedly you're going to harm the child. Yeah. They've flipped the whole thing around. And I believe this is going to advance one step at a time if something's not done. Now, I do believe we can oppose it. I think just as God raised up people in the Old Testament, certain kings and leaders, and they put the Sodomites out of the land, if you know the history, the Sodomites have done this over and over and over again. Right. In fact, people, a lot of people don't realize when King Henry VIII wanted to get rid of the Inquisition in the Middle Ages, he passed the Buggery Act of 1533. The what? The Buggery Act of 1533, which was an act because he knew that the cardinals and the priests and the monks and so on, that many of them were Sodomites. Martin Luther said the same thing. And so this allowed him to go in and confiscate their land and drive them out of the country, yeah. which is what he did. When Bloody Mary came to power, she overturned the Buggery Act and legalized sodomy again to protect the priests, but she outlawed the Bible. Interesting. There is a verse here. You mentioned the Sodomite, Second Kings 23, 7. Uh, this is... Uh, is that Josiah? Yeah, Who probably is, is Josiah. Anyway, he break down the houses of the Sodomites, and here it is, that were by the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. and to me, that tells you something. It tells you, and, and this is what we're seeing now. We're seeing, um, and I made this statement when I first started doing uh, Watchman Broadcast, Pastor Mike Online, several years ago, was a soft stand on sodomy from a church is going to turn into an acceptance of sodomy mm -hmm. down the road, which then turns into a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're going to push and promote sodomy as being actually, in some cases, a superior lifestyle. What is uh, your experience? We know that we have pastors. And I'll right. tell you, Chris, I'll tell you this. There is a church in this county that, and I know some of the people that go to this church, and I have mentioned this before, and it bugs me to death. There is a church in this county, a Baptist church, and as far as I know, it was at one time a Southern Baptist church, may still be. They have, as a youth min, as a, not a youth minister, a music minister, the music minister of this church, he was brought up from another church, him and his wife and his family. While they were there at this church in this county, the man and his wife divorced. The reason for the divorce was because his sodomite 
relationship was getting in the way of his relationship with his wife. And so they divorced. He keeps his job as the music minister at this Southern Baptist Church, even though he's divorced, even though it is known, it was never said from the pulpit, but it is known by the people that go to this church, or at least some of them, that he's a sodomite. Mm -hmm. It is known, he runs a business in this town, and all you have to do is go into that business and talk to the, you know, you just get a sense, right? You just go in, <laughs> yeah, okay. And you walk in and you're going, yep, gotcha. I know who you are, okay? And then people say, oh, you're judging me. Well, no, you're the one acting that way. But anyway, it's known by people in this church that he is a sodomite, that their marriage bust, busted up over sodomy, and he still gets to be the music lead. Now, watch, he is doing what some think Lucifer did in heaven, leading the choirs in praise to God. But he is now still leading church people in praise and worship. And the man is, yeah. and you know, his boyfriend sitting there and his ex-wife's boyfriend is sitting in the other pew. Okay. This stuff, this is what's going, and anybody who says anything about it, it's not the lost crowd that get up in arms. It's the church people that get bent out of shape when somebody says anything about it. Because, well, you know, he's still a Christian and he, you know, he's, He's he's one of us and all this and I just don't get that. What do you what do you say about that? Well, I think this is a this is an old conversation. I talk about this on my radio program at Noise of Thunder. Uh, this is an old conversation. If you go to Genesis 19 and you read the account of what uh, what Lot says to the men of Sodom, the men of Sodom were not content to mind their own business and just do their own thing. Right. They had to go down to the house of Lot who was a righteous man. Right. The okay? Bible says so. Yeah, it even says so. All right? And uh, Lot condemned their behavior as being wicked. And they said the same thing to Lot. They said, you know, will you be the judge of us? Okay? He, they basically said, are you judging us? Are you judging us? It was it was the same argument. Right. Uh, effectively, they were, they were arguing. Um, you talked about in the days of Josiah, the Sodomites building up their houses along the walls of the temple. It's like they seek out the holy things of God because I believe they're trying to appease their guilty conscience by trying to normalize their behavior in relation to God. Mm, interesting. That's, that's kind of my perspective on it. And they know that what they're doing is wrong, and they know that God's law condemns their behavior because God has written his law on the hearts of all men. Now, what's interesting is those Sodomites in the days of Josiah, if you research them, the historians tell us they were the ancient Gali, and they were actually transgenders. Wow. Uh, and they would dress up as women and so on and worship their goddess as though they were women. Uh, but, it's, but it's also powerful that in God's law in the Old Testament, God condemns not only sodomy, men with men, but also men putting on the clothing of women. Yeah. Because this is being normal. As you see Bruce Jenner running around <laughs> and uh, insisting that he be called Caitlyn Jenner. I refuse to cooperate with all of that. He is the athlete formerly known as Bruce. Exactly. <laughs> formerly known as Bruce. But they're, they're trying to normalize all of this. Uh, and, yeah, a lot of it goes back to Alfred Kinsey. I think the church has to stand up. We have to stand on the Word of God Absolutely. and oppose this because sodomites have been infiltrating the churches for centuries. Sure. For centuries. What I think we've got to remember, Mike, is this is not the first time this has happened. Sexual depravity, we go back to the days of Moses when um, Balaam uh, taught Balak yeah. to corrupt the children of Israel using sexual immorality and idolatry. In the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus repeatedly makes reference to those who have the doctrine of Balaam. Right. Okay. And then Jezebel, she was teaching fornication and eating things sacrificed to idols under the church and so on. And Jesus condemned her, uh, said, I gave her space to repent, but she repented not and so on. So this has happened repeatedly, repeatedly. I think, but I, I, the reason I'm saying that is I think we, by the preaching of the word of God, 
proclaiming God's commands. We can oppose this. We can drive it out of the church. Amen. You know, I just had a thought. How many, how many people sneak into, creep into Buddhist temples and secretly try to get the monks to change their doctrine? Hmm. How many people sneak into Muslim mosques, infiltrate these mosques, and then try to get these Muslims to change their God or to change their doctrine or to quit blowing up buses or what? How many, how many infiltrators are there that sneak into Jehovah's Witness groups? How many infiltrate, how many Southern Baptists or independent Baptists have gone into Mormon temples posing as Mormons, trying to um, get the Mormons to stop believing and teaching what it is they teach. I don't know of any program from the Southern Baptist, the Independent Baptists, the Nazarenes, the Pentecostals. I don't know of any program anywhere where they infiltrate other religions to try to sneak them and try to get the Buddhists to become Muslim. I don't, I don't see that. Jude said, certain men crept in unaware. They actively seek to creep into Christian churches, Christian denominations, Christian publishing companies, Christian seminaries, Bible colleges, um, you name it. If it's Christian, there are going to be infiltrators who come in. The whole point of the Jesuit order was to infiltrate Protestantism, bring them to their knees, and bring either kill them or bring them back under Rome. I don't know of a reverse program that seeks to go into these cults and these false religions to try to get them to change. It's only Christian, only Bible Christianity. That ought to tell you folks that what we're doing is the right thing. You know it's the right thing because the devil hates it so bad. Let's go ahead. Uh, no, I want to add one thing to that because some people think when you talk about the Jesuits infiltrating organizations and so on, they, they, they're likely to think, some of them anyway, that that's just a silly conspiracy theory. I usually point, but first of all, you got many historians who all affirm that that's the operation of the Jesuits. Right. But you even had guys like uh, President John Adams who affirmed that in a, one of his letters to Thomas Jefferson. He said uh, when the Jesuits were reinstated in 1814 and 15, he said to Jefferson, I do not like the reappearance of the Jesuits. Wow. He says, will we not have swarms of them coming into our country as poets, as merchants, as ministers, as... Uh, you know, uh, businessmen and writers, etc., as lawyers, because they would adopt all these different professions and so on to infiltrate every part of society. And that was acknowledged by John Adams and many others. So, not a conspiracy theory, it's well documented. Conspiracy fact Psalm 139, thine, verse 16 Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, God wrote a book. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. The Bible, here we, here we have David, 3,000 years ago, before uh, Watson and Crick, I think David should have got the Nobel Prize for discovering mm -hmm. DNA. Because here we have David, 3,000 years before Watson and Crick, accurately describing what DNA was, how it worked, um, and, and he called it a book. And he, here's, my, here's my model here, okay? Here's, here's how this book works. You have, since it's a book and since God wrote it, then it looks like the Bible. You have these two rungs and they're made of phosphorus, which is light, and they're made of sugar because the Word of God always tastes sweet. And then you have the base pairs in the middle, and there's exactly four of them. 
So picture this rung here is the Old Testament. This rung here is the New Testament. And these four base pairs are the four Gospels that join these two things together. The four Gospels are what joins the Old Testament with the New Testament. That gives it, it gives it light. It gives it sense and meaning. The Word is Jesus Christ. And the words in DNA are not found in the, um, the exterior rungs. They're found in the connection of these four base pairs. These four base pairs in three code sections will make an amino acid. There are precisely 22 of these amino acids. And these amino acids in, in a certain grouping will make the genes that make you and I what we are. It, it's made me six foot three. It's made me um, male. It's, it's made me with five fingers on each hand, five toes on each foot. Uh, it, my DNA has made me everything that I am. And the word of that DNA is made by these four base pairs. This is where, if you look in your Bible, this is where the word is revealed to mankind. He's revealed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So the Bible is a, or excuse me, DNA is a book that God wrote. And by the way, 22 amino acids. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. It's written in Hebrew. So it is a book that God wrote and since it is a book that God wrote, and God wrote the DNA of Mike Hoggart, he wrote the DNA of Chris Pinto, he wrote the DNA of my little doggy at home. Do you have a pet at home? Do you kids have pets? Uh, we don't. Oh, not, what is not, wrong may, with that? Maybe, maybe one day. <laughs> maybe one day. Goldfish, cats, dogs, elephants, giraffes, hippopotamuses, um, you name it. If it's alive, on this planet, it has DNA. If it's alive, God wrote a book for them called Deoxyribonucleic Acid. That DNA book is their book of life. It is exactly the way God designed it. God wanted apples red. God wanted um, oranges orange. He wanted uh, lemons to be really sour. He wanted chocolate and sugar to be sweet. I mean, this is how God, it is how God wanted everything. When God said, let this happen, when God said, let this happen in Genesis chapter one, it was done according to the word of God. It was done according to the book that God said. So those of you who know me and have followed uh, our ministry here, you know, that when I start seeing people manipulating DNA, I know that they're violating. We went over this uh, last night. We went over this Tuesday and passed a mic online. Deuteronomy 4.2, you shall not add unto the word which I commanded you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. Revelation 22, um, if any man, if any Monsanto, if any seed company, if any biotech group, if any man shall add unto the, the prophecies, the words of the prophecies of this book, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book and in verse 20, he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Jesus Christ himself gave his consent to what John wrote concerning the book that God wrote. God wrote DNA. God intended for it to be a certain way. Man now thinks that he's smart enough to rewrite DNA. And here's the big article of the week. Firestorm Brewing as scientists work to create, here we go, synthetic human DNA. Last May, a seemingly commonplace meeting kicked off 
a firestorm of controversy. More than 100 experts in genetics and bioengineering convened at Harvard Medical School for a meeting that was closed to the public. And you know, they didn't invite me. I was kind of, I was kind of put out. I thought maybe you you didn't get the invite. I thought maybe one of my grandkids took the invitation and ate it. That's what I thought. Uh, but anyway, attendees were asked not to contact news media or to post about the meeting on social media. Mm. That sounds like a Bilderberg meeting. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. What are they hiding? What are they hiding? The same group is getting back together in New York next week. To the meeting organizers, last year's secretive measures were counterintuitively to make sure as many people heard about the project as possible. They were submitting a paper about the project to a scientific journal and were discouraged from sharing the information publicly before it was published. Now, here we go. Fasten your seatbelts. But there's another reason why this group of scientists, while encouraging debate and public involvement, would be wary of attracting too much attention. Their project is an effort to synthesize... DNA, including human DNA. Cue the music. Their, um, researchers will start with simpler organisms, such as microbes and plants, but hope to ultimately create strands of human genetic code. Create them from scratch. One of the group organizers, Jeff Beck, director of the Institute for Systems of Genetics at New York School of Medicine, told CNBC that incorporating synthesized DNA into mammalian or even human cells, here we go, could happen in four to five years. Folks, I, I mean, I said it last year that 2017 was going to be the year of the transhuman agenda coming to fruition. The new man, man getting involved in his own evolution, taking over from God and nature, literally taking the reins from God, saying, God, we don't need you anymore. What we're going to do is that we are going to rewrite our own DNA. We are going to uh, take out what we don't like. We're going to insert what we want. We will be gods. We will be able to do more than the human uh, predecessors. We are going to erase mortality. And you can take every bit of this go right back to Genesis where Satan said yea hath God said ye shall not surely die for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil and so we are standing on the edge of the cliff and over the edge of the cliff is the bottomless pit and here is mankind and he wants to ascend above the heights of the clouds. He wants to become a god. He wants to be immortal. He wants this body, with all of its wickedness, to enjoy everlasting sinfulness, everlasting pride, everlasting lasciviousness, everlasting uh, fornication. He wants to be able to do that forever and forever and forever. And we are standing on the verge this year. Now they're telling us that they're not only going to synthesize, recreate human DNA, that it is highly possible, I would say highly probable. If it hasn't happened already, it would just, it would surprise me. You know what I think this is, Mike? Yeah, go ahead. As, as I'm hearing you talk, this, I would call this the progress of Frankenstein. Have you ever studied the book, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? No, but I've seen the movie. All right. Now, it was written according to the critics. The modern Prometheus. Modern Pr Prometheus. Yeah. But it was written as an allegory of the French Revolution. Ah. And in the French Revolution, the French. basically, 
what they did is they wanted to abolish God in France. That's what the Jacobins did, the, the rebels and so on. They abolished God in France and they said, we're going to create our own system, our completely own system of government and ideas and so on. In fact, they were so anti-God and anti-Christ that they created their own calendar because they wanted to abolish both Saturday and Sunday right. to get rid of the Sabbath and the Lord's Day. Uh, and then they came up with a 10-day calendar that didn't work. But Mary Shelley wrote the book Frankenstein as an allegory of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And that's why Dr. Frankenstein is, you know, his monster is called the creature. Because in the Bible, man is called the creature. You, know, you have the creator and we are the creatures. Yeah. We're God's creation, the creature. And so that's why the Frankenstein monster becomes a creature. But what happens? This monster or this creature comes back to haunt Dr. Frankenstein and destroys his entire household. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Fra Frankenstein, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Frankenstein. <laughs> but, but that's what I see this as. First man began this with his own philosophy. This all developed into, because the French Revolution becomes secular humanism. Right. And militant atheism and socialism and communism, exactly the issues we're dealing with in our country right now. And now, just like you said, they're taking it a step further. They're saying, we, we want to adapt our own philosophies. We want to get rid of the law of God. Mm -hmm. And now we want to see if we can get rid of God in the temporal realm as well, the physical realm, where we don't need him to make babies and, and make us healthy and this kind of thing. We're going to take control of this whole process and uh, create our own race, our own everything. Uh, it is, I think, a return to the Tower of Babel, but in modern Bingo. times. Bingo. Yeah. The, um, the bricks of the Tower of Babel are humanity, humans, us. We're the bricks. Um, the project called G.P. Wright. Um, let's see if I can find what that means. G.P. Wright, Human, Human Genome Project, Genome Project Wright. Uh, the project, the intention of G.P. Wright is to provide a better fundamental understanding of how these pieces, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, how they work together using synthesized genomes has both pragmatic and theoretical implications. It could lead to lower cost and higher quality of DNA synthesis, discoveries about DNA assembly in cells, and the ability to test many DNA variations. Uh, Dr. Beck said, if you do that, you gain a much deeper understanding of how a complicated apparatus goes Beck likens the genome to a bicycle. You can only fully understand something once you take it apart and put it back together. Really, a synthetic genome is an engine for learning new information. Now, my idea, my theory on this is this, and Chris, I want to hear yours in a minute, but here's my, here's my theory. The devil, God offered man in the Garden of Eden the opportunity to have immortality. He gave him, he gave Adam access to the tree of life, gave him access to all the trees of the garden and said, eat up, you can have it all. There is one exception. There is this one tree, tree of knowledge of good and evil, you cannot eat of it, for in the day you do, you shall die. And so God gives Adam access to all of these trees, and so far as we know now, Adam has no inclination toward going after that tree of knowledge of good and evil. In other words, well, God said I'm not supposed to eat from it. So it's we don't see in the scriptures that it's really a big deal with him. Here comes the dragon. Here comes Satan. He doesn't go to Adam. Adam's the recipient of the word of God. He doesn't go to Adam. He goes to Eve. Eve herself is already guilty of adding to God's word when she said, neither shall ye touch it. God never said that. So we know the devil's got to be thinking, I've got her. She's going to be an easy setup here. She's already fallen right into my hands. So he says, yea, hath God said, bringing into question what God, God's word said. You mentioned it last night. You said it very well, Chris. 
They're walking away. They're coming out of these seminaries, and they have very little knowledge of the scriptures because they have been taught. When I went to Bible college, it was 30, let's see, I entered in 1984. That was 33, ooh, 33 years. 33. Dun, dun, dun. I got to have some music here. Dun, dun, dun. 33 years ago, I entered the halls of the Great Learning Institution, okay? And I was told then, and even then, all of us college students were carrying uh, a King James Bible. There wasn't any of them that, that I knew of that had an NIV back then. This was 1984. Again, 1984, George Orwell. Cue the music, okay? Yeah. So anyway... 1984, I go to Bible college, and I'm hearing for the first time, this manuscript says this, while this manuscript says this, and this translation, this is a better translation than the King James, and I'm hearing that for three years. I'm getting the pressure from my peers, the other students, and I cave. I give in, okay? And when I compare what they were tossing at me then 33 years now into the future, 33 years later, I can only imagine the garbage that is being fed to these young seminarians who have already come from tainted churches, now going to seminary, themselves becoming more and more tainted and corrupt in their minds unclean in their minds and and Paul said to him that is unclean all things are unclean and so they have such an unclean mind they don't think the Bible's right they don't think the Bible's clean they don't they don't think anything of it that that group of ministers and pastors when it comes now to changing human DNA they're going to go for it they're going to say oh yeah that's wonderful that's going to cure cancer that's going in fact Jesus wants us to do that but here's my thing. I think that this um, homo deus, the new species of man, is going to be a god. It falls exactly in line with Genesis chapter 3. Ye shall be as gods, plural, little g, gods. In other words, you're going to be like us devils here, knowing good and evil. A man, man is going to use that, like in the Tower of Babel, his his idea in his mind is that of Lucifer, and that is to ascend as high as he can possibly go. So now, for the first time, we are realistically looking at the possibility of sending people as high as, not just the moon, but Mars. Even telling these people, we're going to send them to Mars, even telling them, now, we're going to send you there, but we don't have a way of bringing you back. You're going to die on Mars. Is that okay? And thousands of people showed up and said, yeah, that's us. We want that. And why do they want that? Because it's in our wicked nature to ascend as high as we can go. So the manipulation of man's DNA, to me, is exactly the same as Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, the manipulation of God's word, the critical scholars looking at the King James, looking at the Texas Receptus, and saying there are things in there that we don't think should be in there. So we're going to take them out. The geneticist, the biologist, looks at DNA, Monsanto spending billions of dollars looking at the DNA of wheat saying, we don't like some of the things that are in that wheat. We're going to take that out. And because now our DNA editing system is so easy and so cheap and so accurate, we're not only going to take things out, but we're going to add in whatever we want to add into that. And it's going to make the seed better. Do you remember what Ahab offered Naboth? I will give you a better vineyard. Well, Ahab, if it was really better, why are you giving it away to <laughs> Naboth? Okay, If it's really that good. So my idea is, Chris, is that 
the geneticist is offering mankind another gospel because the book that God wrote, whether it's our Bible or our DNA, has rules. And the rules are you cannot add to it, you cannot take away from it. And what the geneticist is doing is no different than what, and I want to hear your opinion on how you think the Sinaiticus, or they'll say the Vaticanus, how you think the Vaticanus ended up with all of these missing words and missing verses. So keep that in your mind. Okay. Because the same method and the same ideology that whoever produced the Vaticanus, the same thing about them seeing things in the writings of Paul, in the revelation of John, in the four gospels, that they didn't like it. They didn't believe in it. They didn't like it. They didn't like what it was going to produce, so they took it out. The same idea. Now, remember, it's the same spirit. The prince of the power of the air works in the children of disobedience. It doesn't matter if they're wearing their collar frontwards or backwards. It's the same spirit. And so now the biologist and the geneticist is looking at things in human DNA and says, I don't like what's in your DNA. I don't like what's in my DNA. Let's take it out. And then let's replace it with a better vineyard. And people are going to, people and ministers, pastors of churches, church leaders, denominational leaders, the Pope, they're all going to tell mankind, Jesus wants you to get your DNA changed. He wants you to do that. Now I'll turn it over to you. You tell me what your spin on it is. Tell me how right I am. Well... Well, you know, now on the DNA stuff, I am, that's not my area of expertise, so I couldn't really go into a whole lot on the DNA. However, I can comment on Codex Vaticanus. Gotcha. Let me talk about that. Um, now, on Codex Vaticanus, there's two, and uh, here's how it may relate. The part of what we go over in one of our films, Bridge to Babylon, which was part three in our History of the Bible series, was how the original text of the New Testament in particular was altered by early heretical groups known as the Gnostics. And it's generally believed that in the first century when the Apostle Paul is talking about those who come preaching another Jesus and another gospel and so on, that part of that warning may well have uh, pertained to the Gnostics. In fact, some of the Jews in, in that time were influenced by Gnosticism, which again is based in the ancient mystery religions Babylon, Egypt, Greece and Rome etc. That's where that's kind of the foundation for Gnosticism and they mingled it with New Testament teaching and the New Testament writings and so on. By the time you get into the second century you have Irenaeus about 180 AD warning that you had groups like the Marcionites. There were a whole bunch of different Gnostic groups throughout mm -hmm. Egypt one of them were the followers of Marcion. Marcion in particular, he was a notorious heretic. Everybody condemned Marcion as a heretic, obviously except his followers. <laughs> but he was known for altering the text of the New Testament in that he cut out portions of the text of Scripture that he did not agree with. All right. The exact, you mentioned that. There is the, the new talk now amongst DNA alteration is called CRISPR. CRISPR, the CRISPR editing system is actually based upon the research that a, a lady by the name of Jennifer Doudna, D-U-A, get this, her, her last name is spelled D-U-A-D-N-A. Her name has <laughs> DNA in it, okay? Jennifer Doudna discovered that there was this bacteria that had genetic code in it that they didn't understand at first why it had it in there because it didn't seem to have any functional use. Then somebody figured out that the genetic code that this bacteria had in its in its DNA looked amazingly similar to some viruses that they knew of. Hmm. So they started looking at it and they found out that this bacteria actually made uh, when it encountered a virus, it actually made a copy. A virus is nothing but a strand of RNA. 
a code. And so the, the bacteria actually made a copy of that virus's genetic code and stored it so that if it ever encountered it again and that, vac and that uh, virus actually invaded and attacked this bacteria, the bacteria had a like a missile defense system in it. It had a pair of scissors. The bacteria would then scan its own DNA and because it had the model of the virus's DNA to look for, it had like a picture of the Joker, okay? Had a picture of the evil thing that wants to kill me and it would scan its own DNA and when it found the virus inside its DNA, it would take an enzyme called Cas9, which is nothing more than a genetic pair of scissors. And it would cut out of its own DNA that virus, throw it out, and then stitch the two strands back together again. It, and it would be as if that was never there again. And so what Jennifer Doudna figured out was we can use this to then, we can, we can pre-program this bacteria inject it into a host and that bacteria because it has a copy it has a picture of what it's looking for it can scan your dna all 300 billion base pair connections it can look for a certain gene and it can cut it out and it can either replace it with something else or it can stitch the two uh, strands back together again as if that was never there and completely take it out it used basically a biological pair of scissors just like what you're just i said it i said i think the biologists are going to do and are doing what who'd you say this was marcion 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 the same thing marcion did he saw things in the text that he didn't like he cut them out well, not only did he cut, he cut them out, his followers did the same, it is said by Irenaeus, and the other Gnostic groups, uh, other Gnostic leaders, whether they cut things out or they altered things, they changed them and so on, they felt they had the power and the authority to alter the text of the New Testament writings, right. that they didn't necessarily have to obey it as the Word of God. Now, the Gnostics were even known, this is where, you know, you have this interesting Frankenstein you know, playing the creator element and right. work. The Gnostics even created all-out false gospels. They're the ones who created the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Judas, yeah. the another one called the Gospel of Truth. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we talk about in Bridge is that uh, many of the papyri that they use for the critical text in the 20th century that were discovered were discovered in Nagamadi in Egypt right. and they were discovered a short distance away from a Gnostic library mm -hmm. where they had all these Gnostic writings and one of them is the so-called Gospel of Truth that is warned about by Irenaeus in the second century that this was a new creation the Gnostics had come up with but anyway they're just fabricating these stories right. Uh, about the apostles, about Mary Magdalene, and so on. And again, Th who has who has privily snuck in to rewrite the Quran? <laughs> exactly. You know? No one has. No one's re no one's wanting to rewrite the Quran. No one's wanting to rewrite the Book of Mormon, and add stuff to that and say, "Oh, the Mormons left this out." No one's wanting to do that. It's only Bible Christianity that the devil hates. Yeah, the, the attacks on the Bible, there's no question, brother. I mean, these attacks have gone on really from the first century. That's the remarkable thing. One of the things, I don't know if we're going to get to this today or not, but the, uh, the foundation of the critical text argument is the idea that older is better. That if they right. find a manuscript right. that is allegedly older than the other manuscripts, they argue, well, that one is closer to the original right so it must be more accurate. Mm -hmm. What they deny in that thinking is the fact that you had heretics from the first century right. that were corrupting the letters of Paul. Paul even warns about that. Corrupting Paul's letters, uh, corrupting the writings of the New Testament all the way in the first and second centuries. So if, as uh, Dr. Phil Stringer put it, when I interviewed him, he said if Paul wrote the book of Romans in the first century, and then one of his adversaries got hold of it 
and rewrote certain portions of it and created a counterfeit copy. And let's say this were done about 60 A.D. or something. And then somebody buried it in the sand and dug it up in 1850. It would be the most ancient copy of the Book of Romans you ever found, but it would be corrupt. Right. So just because it's older doesn't necessarily mean it's more accurate or closer to the truth. Paul said, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God already in Paul's day. As, I mean, as soon as he's writing these epistles, men, these Gnostics, are getting a hold of them. They're finding things they don't like, and so they take them out and they rewrite their own version of these New Testament books. So these New Testament, um, these false manuscripts end up in the hand of who? Who was it that you think and I know you're going to talk about uh, Sinaiticus later on, but who was it, do you think, that that wrote the Vaticanus? Because the Vaticanus well, was around in 1604 and known about by the King James translators, was it not? Right. Now, there's I have two theories on Vaticanus, and I'm still researching, but there's two main... The things that... Vaticanus dates back to 1475. That's the earliest date, official date that's acknowledged in the Vatican Library. Prior to 1475, any history that anybody gives to it is speculation. Mm -hmm. They can't prove it. Uh, and that's even said by the, the most modern paleographers. I quote uh, J. Neville Birdsall. He worked with the top scholars. He passed away in 2005. Birdsall said, look, people have all these theories about Vaticanus. The truth is nobody can trace it outside the 15th century. That's just the fact. Right. Uh, so anything is speculation. Erasmus rejected Vaticanus because he believed it was a forgery that was created or somehow or other tampered with uh, at the Council of Florence, uh, which happened the century earlier. And it, it happened around the same mm -hmm. time that Vaticanus shows up. And so he believed it was a corruption. And uh, Sepulveda, who was a Vatican librarian, wrote to Erasmus. He said, no, Erasmus, you're wrong. And Erasmus wrote back and said, well, I can't prove it, but he still didn't trust Vaticanus. Right. This is what he had heard. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the reason that's important is because one of the arguments made by people like Dr. James White <laughs> is... <laughs> Got to cue the music on that guy. <laughs> one of the arguments of Dr. White is that Erasmus would have used Codex Vaticanus if he had had the opportunity. <laughs> The reality is Erasmus knew about it. He specifically rejected it. There's even a book. Well, Samuel P. Tregellis talked about this in the 19th century. He acknowledged it. And in modern times, you have a guy named uh, Conrad Martin Hyde. K. Martin Hyde has written a book on Erasmus and so on. But he talks about it as well, that this was most likely the reason why Erasmus wanted nothing to do with Vaticanus. He thought it was a forgery. Well, even the King James translator themselves, if you find a King James Bible that actually has the preface, the uh, the epistle to the readers, where the translators basically wrote, you know, they shared their heart with why they did what they did, how they did it, and so on, you can see very clearly that the translators, King James himself, they despised popery. They did not trust the Vatican, and so in, in the introduction, Mike, they refer to the Pope as the as that man of sin. Yeah, the they believe the Antichrist. Yeah, there's no question. So, uh, yeah, they, they so the the idea that they're going to trust the Vatican manuscript, especially when it's rumored that this was a forgery that was somehow or other created, or again, the other option I think is that Vaticanus could be ancient. It could come from the fourth century. Or, or some period around there, but that it was tampered with by the Church of Rome okay. in the 15th century. And the reason I think that, the paleographers argue, and they admit, like Dr. Scott McKendrick at the British Library acknowledges that the entire manuscript was completely overwritten in the 15th century by a 15th century scribe. Wow. Now, what that means, I mean, they, if you go read up on it, I mean, it's kind of confusing, but they'll tell you that parts of it have been overwritten so many times 
that paleographical analysis is virtually impossible in certain sections. They, they just don't know, honestly. But I think if it is an ancient manuscript, if you fast forward into the 20th century, what happens is they discover all these papyri in Nagamati, and one of the papyri is called P75, and Papyrus 75 matches the Codex Vaticanus better than 90% of the time. Right. Which is a very high percentage rate for those manuscripts right. because they have all kinds of disagreements and corruptions. But anyway, so there are those who believe that the readings that are there are that one is associated with the other. Right. And, and the papyri, P75, was found near a Gnostic library there in Nagamati. Nagamati, Egypt. Egypt. Right, right. In Egypt. So it's possible, I think, and this is a theory I have, that if Vaticanus is of ancient origin, that the omissions that you have there, the changes, the, the really the corruptions that are in it, are the result of this Gnostic tampering. Now, whether it was created by Gnostics or not, I don't think we have any way of knowing, but it could be that the readings were somehow or other repeated from Gnostic writings, that makes sense, or Gnostic yeah. versions of the New Testament. Right. That could be what happened. That's one of the theories I have because of its association with P75. Why do you think so many pastors, as as a pastor, I, you know, I've given my testimony so many times, I used to be on the other side of this, so far on the other side of this, mm -hmm. that I hated King James people. I hated them. I thought they were all legalists. I thought they were buffoons. I thought that they were, um, they were, I, at one time I was going to be a progressive. And I thought that they were not with the times like I was going to be. And I thought that they were holding the church back and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And so God brought me out of that. I'm, I am. I am like Paul on the road to Damascus and the Lord steps in a bright light shines which is his word and all of a sudden I realize that I have been wrong all of these years God very graciously very kindly brought me to this understanding that I can I can trust my Bible in fact it was at a time in my life where I needed to trust the Bible I needed that book mm -hmm. to be right and so, I mean, I know what my re my reasonings were was that, number one, I was getting acceptance from my peers. I was getting acceptance from my professors. And my nature is I want to say things to people that makes them happy with me because then I feel like that they will accept me. And that was, it's all psychological with me, but that's how I was. And so I just kind of let that, and then I developed this attitude about it, that I hated the King James, I hated anybody that, that liked the King James or the Texas Receptus or anything like that. And so my question to you is, why do you think, because the, the evidence is out there, the evidence about West Cotton Hort and the fact that they were Romanists. They preferred the Vatican. They preferred Roman Catholic doctrine. Um, that Westcott and Hort just out of thin air said what you said. Well, these manuscripts are older. Therefore, they are the most reliable manuscripts. Then we have the, and the reason why we have later manuscripts that are right is because the older ones were used and accepted by the church and they were worn completely out while these no good manuscripts were hidden away in a box somewhere and nobody saw, they never saw the light of day for hundreds of years and then all of a sudden now Tischendorf says, voila, Eureka, we have a new Bible here. So with all of this information out there and any pastor could could reach the same conclusion that I've reached, that you've reached. Why are there so many pastors, you think, that are willfully ignorant of this issue of the translations of the, the, manu the Greek manuscripts that are absolutely rotten to the core? They trust, they, now they trust the Vatican for crying out loud to tell them. Here we have a Jesuit, Carlos Martini, on 
the um, the Kurt sitting there with Bruce Metzger and Kurt Alon mm -hmm. on the New Testament Greek committee. Why is it that so many pastors are willfully ignorant of this and are accepting of these new translations? Well, I, I'll, I'll say this. I, I need to say this because I think it's very important. Um, as I, we, we did the research on our History of the Bible series, parts one, two, and three. They're each three hours long. So the, the work on it was spread out over a number of years. And I had the opportunity to interview uh, many different people on this issue and a number of pastors that we interview are from the older generation and they had some interesting things to say one of them was that when they were in seminary nobody even told them that there were two versions of the Greek manuscripts they, wow. they never told them that you have the Texas Receptus over here and then you have the critical text over there the Westcott and Hort text yeah. They never knew that there was any difference. They were just told, well, in the Greek, it says this, mm -hmm. and in the Greek, that. Right. And we'll see, then they would show them the, the critical text, the Westcott and Hort text, and they would say, well, look, the King James, see the King, J in the Greek, it says this, and the King James translators added these things in. Yeah, that's see what, what I'm I saying? had a guy tell me. That's what they would tell them. So they didn't realize that there was another Greek text, the received text, that was considered the text received by all from the time of about the King James translation shortly after, right. um, all the way up until 1881 when you have the revision committee. They didn't know anything about that. And so they had to learn it after they got out of seminary. So I actually developed compassion on a lot of these guys. I have friends who are ministers and they generally accept the Westcott and Hort theory. They're sincere men of God. They love the Lord, and typically they believe that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. Um, that's what they believe. They just don't understand the complexity of these arguments. You see what I'm saying? Because yeah. a lot of the information is withheld from them. That's what, what we learned. Uh, the real history of Codex Sinaiticus, for example, is, is all but completely removed from whatever anybody is taught when they go to Bible college or seminary or anything. Same thing with Codex Vaticanus. They're simply not telling people an accurate history, even if you believe their history, their version of the history. Uh, one of the things I like to point to is the ending of the Gospel of Mark, the last 12 verses right. of Mark. You have in Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the last 12 verses of Mark are deliberately omitted from both of those manuscripts. That's why most of your study Bibles today, including many King James study Bibles, they'll have a footnote at the right. ending of Mark that says the most ancient and reliable manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, do not contain the last 12 verses of Mark. Okay, that's what it'll say. And then there'll be some other commentary, but that's very, very common. What they don't tell you is and this is just believing their version of it. They believe both of those manuscripts come from the fourth century. They also believe that the scribe who wrote the New Testament portion of Codex Vaticanus was the same scribe who went in and edited portions mm -hmm. of Codex Sinaiticus, including the ending of Mark. Wow. That, that another scribe had actually written the Gospel of Mark and the Vaticanus scribe came in and changed the ending of Mark and created the shorter ending. Yeah. Okay, but they don't tell anybody that. If you believe their version of the history, then what the footnote should say is that of all the thousands of manuscripts that contain the Gospel of Mark, one scribe in the entire history of the church chose to omit the last 12 verses in both of these manuscripts. Wow. You mentioned uh, in... Uh the Fargo Red River Conference mm -hmm. uh, two years ago, you said something I had not ever heard, but it just floored me. In relation to Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, and, and verses 9 through 20 are the resurrection portion mm -hmm. of the Gospel of Mark. All four Gospels give the account of the death and the resurrection of Christ. Mark's version of the resurrection is contained in verses 9 through 20. Mm -hmm. Now you said something, and I'm going, to, I'm going to say it wrong, so I want you to correct me on it. You said something about the v 
Vatican's official position of the four Gospels was that Mark was the first Gospel written, and since his was the first Gospel written, and his Gospel did not include, in their opinion, verses 9 through 20, which is the resurrection scene uh, from the life of Christ, therefore, the real true gospel has nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ. It is, and this is my two cents worth into this, it is what the Catholic priest does thousands of times a day all over the world, and that is sacrifice Jesus all over again in the Mass so that people can be temporarily saved from destruction. Tell me what it was that you, that information that you reported there at the Red River Prophecy well, Conference. Well, the, the one point I want to correct on there is that ahead. you said the Vatican and the Catholic Church, that that's their official position. I don't know that that's their official position. Right. However, uh, it it is the fact that the last 12 verses of Mark are missing from Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, that has, what happened was, if you read James Bentley's book, Bentley has a book called Secrets of Mount Sinai. He gives the whole history here. Mm -hmm. But they have this doctrine that they call the Markan Priority. And the Markan Priority is the idea that Mark, the Gospel of Mark, was the first Gospel written. When most people hear that, they think it's pretty harmless. However, our, in our Bibles, it's Matthew first, right. then Mark, then Luke, then John. Um, most people think it doesn't really matter, and to a certain extent, we might agree with them. However, why are they manipulating Mark and trying to insist that Mark was the first gospel written? When throughout the history of the church, everybody's always believed that it was Matthew. Matthew right. was first written, then Mark. But they want to f switch it around. Bentley describes it. He says when Codex Sinaiticus was discovered, prior to that you had the Codex Vaticanus. Vaticanus was the only manuscript in existence in Greek that deliberately omitted the last 12 verses of Mark. Mm. Then Tischendorf discovers the New Testament portion of Sinaiticus in 1859. Now you have two manuscripts that deliberately omit the last 12 verses of Mark. Now Bentley says, well, when that happened, it wasn't really significant because Matthew was the first gospel written and then Mark and so on. So he says, well, it wasn't really significant. Then he says, but then <laughs> when these critics conducted a detective-like investigation into the internal evidence of the gospels themselves, which basically means they go in and they make up all these theories about right. what they think happened, uh, then through some clever argumentation, they then began to argue that no Mark was the first gospel written. But what is driving their motivation, Mike? Right. Their motivation is they want to argue that Mark was first because in the last 12 verses of Mark, that's where Jesus bodily appears after the resurrection, mm -hmm. where he physically appears to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection that's what's contained in those last 12 verses. So what they argue is, and Bentley explains it, that if Mark was first and the last 12 verses were not originally there, then they say that must mean that Jesus never physically rose from the dead and that his followers made up the story later on wow. and added it to Matthew and Luke and John. And then they went and they had to make up some version and, and put it on there on Mark. Okay, that's what they argue. Right. And they say, well, this proves in their view that Jesus did not bodily rise from the dead. And then Bentley, who's kind of a new age guy, uh, said, oh, we can believe in a in a spiritual resurrection. Mm -hmm. now, I personally think the reason they want to do that is they want to associate Jesus with Buddha and Krishna and Muhammad and so on. And that way you can say that they, yes, they're all alive in eternity, supposedly. They've all been resurrected spiritually. Right. But the reality is we know, brother, that it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He overcame death by the power of God. He was raised from the dead bodily. When he appeared to the apostles, uh, he said specifically, it says specifically, they thought 
they had seen a spirit, and he says, No, handle me and see. A spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. Yeah. He specifically testifies he is a physical, living, right. raised up from the dead raised Savior. The, the same body that went into the tomb, same body that came amen. out of the tomb. And he and, says to Thomas, yeah. here, reach your hand in my side. Yeah, amen. Touch the holes in my hands and be not faithless but believing. Praise the Lord. All right. Now, um, we've got about uh, 30 minutes left, and um, I've been holding on to the best information until last. Uh, but I want to give uh, you guys that are viewing this live an opportunity uh, to write in. The, the email address is pastormikeonline at gmail.com. If you are watching at www.pastormikeonline.com, there is a little form that you can fill out. You can send in your email request. We will get them here. And so if there's anything that you think is relevant, I don't, I'm not, if you're a troll, I'm not going to read your email, so don't even bother. Uh, but anyway, um, if you've got anything that, anything you heard last night, anything that you've heard today, and you would like a question answered, send that to pastormikeonline at gmail.com. Now, Tuesday. I was, uh, man, I tell you what, I was with it. I um, uh, went through my Evernote account. At, do, you use, do you use Evernote? No. Oh, my goodness, Chris, come on. This is not the 20th century anymore. The Windows, Windows 3.1, are you still using Windows 3.1? No. I use Evernote, and any, any article that people send me, like I've gotten three or four articles today. There was three on Drudge, Drudge Report alone. I send them to Evernote, and when I do research in something, all I have to do is pull up my Evernote account, and I can pull it up on my tablet, my phone, uh, any desktop, any anywhere. And I now I'm not a paid spokesman for Evernote, but anyway, it's just made my job so easy because if I'm reading a book, and it's like it's a handheld book, and I see something in there, I'll take a photograph of it, and Evernote accepts that like a fax like a copy mm. of the page and stores it in there uh, and I can I can annotate it I can add notes to it or I can highlight certain places and so on but anyway so I go through my Evernote account Tuesday and um, and I'm just looking at things that I had collected over the years pertaining to the Bible translation issue and there was a woman that emailed me and um, she had, uh, she said, she said at first, you know, I thought we thought we found the right church. We thought we found a church that was going to honor the word of God. And uh, she said she, her and her husband, I guess, went there for a while. And then um, they, she asked the pastor, who was a, sort of a young pastor, uh, about the King James. She said, I saw his face change. And he got a little irritated and so on. And then all of a sudden now he's preaching a four-part series on the Bible translation issue. And it's not favorable to the King James. And then he, he hands out this, this pamphlet, this flyer. And, um, and I was reading quotes from this on Tuesday's program. I showed it to you yesterday when you arrived. And you immediately looked at some of the names that were on here. And you said... This pamphlet is not telling the whole truth. Mm -hmm. The whoever put this this was sent out by the Fundamental Baptist Fellowship, which, uh, if I remember right, the Fundamental Baptist Fellowship broke off from the Independent Baptist movement, and I think they primarily broke off over the Bible translation issue, sort of like what the the the. Um, the sequence of events that has separated Bob Jones University from, uh, I think, Pensacola Christian College. They have, they put out videos back in the 90s, kind of lobbing grenades and missiles at one another over the translation issue. And one of the things that I heard from the Bob Jones video was, and, and my memory may be foggy on this, was there was a commission of these great, you know, esteemed uh, critical scholars sitting there and essentially what they said was yes we're pastoring fundamental churches and yes we'll preach out of the King James however we know 
that there are many deficiencies uh, in the King James. We know there's many deficiencies in the Textus Receptus, and we know that there's better manuscripts, and, and we kind of look to those other manuscripts while we're doing our study. And so basically what they were saying was, we're pretending to be King James, but we're really not. And so here's this, this fundamental Baptist church pretending to be conservative, but then they use this material and they're quoting from John Wesley, J.C. Ryle. They actually use the King James translators in here, D.L. Moody, C.I. Schofield. Um, and you had mentioned something about that, that they weren't, they weren't giving the truth. Gabelin, uh, Oswald Chambers, uh, Dean Bergen, which I, I was surprised because you've, you've talked about Dean Bergen in your series, A Lamp in the Dark, and then uh, Tears Among the Wheat, and then Bridge to Babylon. You mentioned Dean Bergen. Dean Bergen was a, I guess, a, a, a fierce proponent of the Texas Receptus. And here they're quoting Bergen like he's in opposition to the Texas Receptus. And there was some other names on here. And so I gave you this document and what I wanted you to do. And I, we talked about it. We got Bob Jones, John Rice, uh, Bob Jones Jr. And so on. What I was, what I asked you to do was go through here and tell us the truth on some of these names and some of the, what they actually believed instead of what was, and, and I can say this, if somebody, if somebody, um, took a quote from Mike Hoggard 22 years ago, 23 years ago, 24 years ago, they might hear me say, I think there's mistakes in all the translations. I think there's no way we can know really what the, what the Bible really says, and maybe we should use the NIV. If somebody wanted to go find something I did 20 some odd years ago, put a quote up on the internet, then people would be there. I mean, you know how the internet works nowadays. You know how stuff like this works. Mm -hmm. You can take a quote from me back in the day when I didn't believe this stuff and then make everybody on the internet think that I'm putting up a front that I don't really believe what I tell everybody that I believe. And what they would be doing is they would be representing me in a false way and that's what according to you that's what you found tuesday just looking through that list well this is a this let me say this this is a complex issue there's no question because the quotes that they're using are i mean they are quotes from these men but it's important to understand the issues at hand and what what they're saying and what they're not saying in my immediate reaction was their mentioning of charles haddon spurgeon uh, and then guys like R. L. Dabney, uh, and then John Bergen, and so on, to present these men as if they somehow or other supported the work of Westcott and Hort, you know, without any contest, and so on, to me is just very, very misleading. Right. Or the philosophies that have been hatched through the 20th century as a result of their work is very, very misleading. Spurgeon is probably one of the most important figures here. Certainly when the revision, when the work of Westcott and Hort was published in 1881, Spurgeon generally agreed with the textual analysis, the arguments that were being made by Westcott and Hort. Of course, he was operating on the premise that Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, what he was being told about the history of those manuscripts was accurate based mm -hmm. on the Westcott and Hort theory. He was he was receiving that as though it were scientifically provably true, okay. So when they made certain uh, omissions and things like that, Spurgeon, there's no getting around it. In his sermons, he did seem to agree with certain changes that they made. He did not, however, uh, like the revision itself in terms of its wording and so on. He thought the uh, uh, the King James, the Authorized Version, was far superior. And he did not believe that the uh, the revised edition uh, would replace the the KJV. That was his view. But here's the thing: those quotes from Spurgeon usually come within the first couple of years after Westcott and Hort's work was done. It's important to remember, Mike, 
that Spurgeon passed away. He died before the private letters of Westcott and Hort were revealed. Right. So he did not know the fact that these guys were closet Romanists. He didn't know that they embraced Darwinism. He, there's a lot of things about Westcott and Hort that Spurgeon did not know. He could not know because many people who criticize Westcott and Hort do so from their private letters, which only were revealed later on. Right. If you read Spurgeon's writings on Rome, we carry a book with our ministry called Geese in Their Hoods, where it's a collection of Spurgeon's writings on Rome. There's no question. Spurgeon said, he said that, uh, he said, it's the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. And as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to, to raise a question. If it be not popery in the Church of Rome, there is nothing on the earth that can be called by that name. He said, popery is abhorred of the Lord, and they that help it wear the mark of the beast. That's a wow. quote from Spurgeon. Yeah. He was very staunch against Rome. So if he had known this about Westcott and Hort, I, find, I think he would have been very, very suspicious about their scholarship at that point. Right. But here's what's important. Before he died, less than a year before he died, one of his final sermons he preached to a bunch of young pastors was called The Greatest Fight in the World. I highly recommend anybody go look up that sermon. It's very powerful. But Spurgeon warned about modern textual criticism. He warned about it. Uh, and he, sa he said, if every time you read your Bible, I'm paraphrasing him, if every time you read your Bible, you have to wonder whether or not the scripture you're reading mm -hmm. is really the word of God. Right. And you have to read a verse and you say, well, I think I'll believe this promise, but wait, I need to go down the road here and talk to the Bible critic and ask him if it's okay if I believe this promise, because I'm not sure if that's really part of the Word of God. Exactly. Spurgeon warned, if this continues, then these critics will rob us of everything we hold dear. That's what he said. Wow. And he, he said to these young ministers, you need to believe in the infallibility of Scripture. You need to believe it fervently. Okay, he was trying to encourage. He, I believe what happened was he saw the impact of this revision mm -hmm. and the critical text, and he observed it for about 10 years before he died, and he said, you know what, this is, this is a problem. I think he recognized it. And there are a lot of ministers who began embracing the Westcott and Hort theory, and then after a while they sort of recognized it's a very destructive theory because it, leads, it puts a perpetual question mark on the Bible. And you're never really sure whether or not what you're reading is the Word of God. In light of that, tell him about Frank Logsdon and his the way he pulled away from translating the New American Standard Bible. Yeah, well, he now important to understand he did he was not a translator for the New okay. American Standard. He worked for uh, and with Dewey Lockman, who was a friend of his, according to his testimony, and he helped pick out. He said some of the men that worked on the translation team that he wrote the um, the introduction, part of the introduction for it, and so on, and that he gave his support to the project. But once it was finished, and he, he maintained that Dewey Lockman himself was a very sincere man. He mm -hmm. was a godly man, and he meant well. He wasn't trying to do any harm to anybody. But when it, it was put together, he said the problem was it was based on the Westcott and Hort text. And he says, is based on this Westcott and Hort text, that was the problem. And, and Lockman said, he used to embrace that text. He thought it was the better, more accurate version. He says, well, what he was taught was the most intelligent, educated people, they embraced the Westcott and Hort text. Mm -hmm. But Lockman came to believe, after he did his research on it, he believed that part of the reason, and he even says this, we show it to you in Bridge to Babylon, mm -hmm. he even said that part of the reason that the Jesuit order was founded as to launch the Counter-Reformation was to overturn the Erasmus text. That's what he said. Yeah. And that he believed the Westcott and Hort text was put forth specifically to undermine the received text. That was his belief. That's his testimony. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of evidence to support what he's saying historically. A lot of evidence to support it. But that was the conclusion that he came to. And he had to write to his friend Dewey Lockman mm -hmm. years later after he discovered all these things because he had all these ministers that were approaching him and saying, 
wait a second, you know, uh, Frank, you worked on this, yeah. you supported it, what about this and what about this? And he said he, he would give answers, but then after a while, he realized he just could not defend all of these changes and so on, and he began to feel very, very guilty about it. Yep. And he said to his wife, he said, I think I'm in trouble with the Lord. Wow. Uh, that was part of his testimony. But we, that's not, some people tried to, to portray Frank Logson's testimony as though it's some kind of conspiracy theory. No, it isn't. Uh, he was uh, he was a prominent teacher in the 20th century, and we actually play the audio of his yeah. interview and his testimony uh, in Bridge to Babylon, but you can also find it online. But he gave a very important testimony, and it you know what I learned from it, Mike. These guys, a lot of these guys who are supporting the critical text. They're not necessarily bad guys. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to undermine the Bible. Many of them believe that this is the most accurate representation of the Scripture. They, they believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. They just don't understand that the arguments that they're being given, they're being told that the critical text is based on a scientific approach to the Bible. Right. And they don't realize that the components of this mm -hmm. are not scientific at all. It's really speculation and theory. Now, one of the names that you have on here is R.L. Dabney. Okay? To present R.L. Dabney as though he somehow or other would support the work of Westcott and Hort, I find to be very alarming. Dabney said the whole thing is a bundle of conjectures. That's a quote from him. Wow. He said whether it's the dating of Sinaiticus or the Vaticanus, the dates, they have no way of proving these things. Mm -hmm. He says the whole theory of Westcott and Hort is just a bundle of conjecture. And really, once you understand the Westcott and Hort theory, uh, and the, the bringing this back to Rome and the Counter-Reformation and the fact that Westcott and Hort were closet Romanists, Dean Bergen analyzed their theory, which he said was about 150 pages long. Right. And one of the most pertinent quotes for me is he says, uh, he says, thus then at last, at the end of exactly 150 weary pages, the secret of it all comes out. He says the one point that the respected editors have all along been driving at. He said the secret of it all comes out at last all is summed up in the Kurt formula, Codex B. Which and is? Codex B is another name for, for Codex Vaticanus, Vatican, right. which is the Vatican's Greek Bible, the Pope's Bible, basically. Yeah. The same Bible that Erasmus rejected because he thought it was a forgery. Right. Back when he was putting his Greek text together, uh, that same Bible is the very centerpiece. It's the foundation of the Westcott and Hort theory. And Bergen said that what they've done is they've engaged all this stuff about conflation and the uh, Syrian text and the neutral text and all these terms that are very, very common among your textual critics today right. were all engineered for the purpose, according to Bergen, of declaring that the Codex Vaticanus is the number one Greek Bible in the world and everything <laughs> else has to be brought into submission to Codex Vaticanus. Now, here's let me let me explain this for those who are not um, understanding the the gravity of this. Is that the whole theory of why the Vaticanus and of course the Sinaiticus are the best manuscripts? The whole theory is is that because they are dated to around 300 A.D., which, if that's true, if Vaticanus is from 300 A.D., about 350, about AD. 350 A.D., then it makes it the oldest manuscript, Greek manuscript, of the New Testament. And Westcott and Hort's theory was, since it's the oldest Greek manuscript, then it must be the closest to the original, therefore, if it's the oldest, it's the best. Now, having said that, then the theory, then if, if Vaticanus, the oldest date that anybody in the world could actually say 
we saw this manuscript on this date was 15 what? You what? said the Vatican is the, the 14, first... 1475. 1475, okay? Then there is evidence, and I would say good evidence, to suggest that the Sinaiticus is not even from the 1600s, the 1500s, the 1400s, that the Sinaiticus is a forgery from the 1800s. Mm -hmm. So... The theory is that the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, being from 350 A.D. or around that area, are the best manuscripts because they are the oldest. But if they are not from 350 A.D., if at best they are from the 1500s, then that theory and all of the Bibles and all of the teachings that are based on that, they are the house built on sand that Jesus talked about. Mm -hmm. And I believe that one of these days, people, that all of us people who believe the King James, who believe in the manuscript line, the vine of Christ that I mentioned last night, I believe at some point that it's going to be shown who's right and who's wrong. Now, I don't know how that's going to happen, but I think there's going to be something that is going to vindicate those of us who have held on to the Word of God and are not letting it go, and all of the evidence aside, we know what our Bible says. We know that it's the truth of Amen. the Word of God. We know that it says of itself that it is the truth of the Word of God. And whatever men may say to you, let them go jump. Because let God be true and every man a liar. Now, I've Amen. got just a, a couple minutes here. Um, very quickly, one question that came in was, do you think the protocols of the learned elders of Zion was a Jesuit based manuscript. Do you think that the Jesuits had their hand in that? There is a, a writer, a former Catholic named Leo Lehman, who was writing during the World War II era. He asserted that the Protocols of Zion were created by the Jesuits. So I think it's very possible, but that's what I know about that. Adulam or Adullam? That's how, you, that's how you pronounce it. I say Adulam, you say Adullam, you say tomato, I eat tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Adullamfilms.com is uh, Chris Pinto's website. Uh, his videos and his research are outstanding. Um, and what is your next project? What are you working on next? We are working on right now a, a documentary called The True Christian History of America. Wow. That's the uh, that's the next upcoming documentary we're, we're producing right now. See, that I like that. I like that kind of stuff. Um, because I think the pilgrims came over here with a Bible in their hand mm -hmm. and they, yep. they meant to establish a land of righteousness and the devil has tried everything in the world uh, to put a stop to that. Chris Pinto, it's been great to have you. We're not done. We're going to use you up. We're not done with you tonight. Starting at 7 o'clock, Pastor Reg Kelly from uh, Liberty Faith Bible Church. He is... Uh, the uh, producer of a video series called A Table in the Wilderness. If you've not seen them, they're outstanding, cute little videos. They're on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, tonight, 7 o'clock, Pastor Kelly. Tonight, uh, Chris Pinto once again. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, myself and Chris Pinto. Once again, the Midwest Bible Conference uh, already. It has, uh, people have been writing in saying that it's been fantastic just the first night, just the time we spent together. And so I thank God that he put it in my heart to do this. I thank Chris for wanting to be part of this. And I appreciate his friendship and his fellowship. And I love working with him. And uh, you keep him and I in your prayers. And please always think Bible wherever you go.